And as the group's coming down, take your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation tonight. Revelation chapter 3, as we're continuing through. Revelation chapter number 3. I mentioned this morning that this is, it wasn't necessarily meant to be a ca- caveat between the two services. Actually, uh, it was about six months ago, excuse me, actually about June, when God began to work in my heart as I was looking ahead to what to preach about preaching through the book of Acts in the morning service through the year. I prefer personally um, expositional preaching. Uh, there's several reasons behind that. One, I love verse by verse. I love the fact, you know, we said this morning, the whole word of God is a narrative. It all points to Jesus, and we want to be able to show that, and exposition is really the best way to do that. I also love that if we ever hit a topic that might be somewhat, mm, you know, no one sits back and says, pastor's in a bad mood today. It's just the next couple of verses. But I, I really love it because it you know, some have said, well, expositional, it's a little easier for the preacher. Yes and no. Can I tell you one thing it does, though? It drives me to make sure that I'm in the right book and in the right place and teaching what God wants. This morning, we preached on the first part of what ended up being two messages on what is a description of a healthy church. We mentioned the aspect of gospel-centered, focused on the gospel, on Jesus, and, and how that implements in so many different aspects. Tonight, we're going to look from Revelation on this topic, the autopsy of a deceased church. Harmony, how many are so excited about that? that? That's what some titles. I can't wait to hear that message. An autopsy is not usually one of those. You can't wait to hear. Let me tell you one of the purposes, one of the things that we push. I'm going to take a minute to do this. We used to have these banners behind us, and then we redecorated. We moved the banners to the wall. If you look to your left, some of you, it's right behind you. Don't try to go too far. The first banners include... The premise of the philosophy is we include anyone and everyone in a church. The second one is impact. It desires to impact them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The third one is in to instruct them, disciple them, and train them. The fourth one is to involve them. It's basically the breakdown of the Great Commission, go in, baptize, teach. To me, I believe if we're doing all of those, then we are healthy and we're growing and we're moving forward. Uh, but what happens when maybe those things are not happening revelation chapter 3 and verse 1 the bible says this and unto the angel of the church in sardis write these things say he that hath the seven spirits of god and the seven stars i know thy works that thou hast a name that thou that thou livest and art dead catch that phrase real quick he says i know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead he says your reputation is you're a good church but you are dead verse 2 he says be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are, uh, that are ready to die. For I have fa- not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Father, tonight, as we examine the Scriptures, I pray you'll help us, uh, give us a full understanding of not just what you're saying here, but, Father, what it means, the deepness of it. Help us, Father, to take our time as we evaluate. But more than that, Lord, and this type of message, this type of topic tonight, may we individually listen to your Holy Spirit. Father, I'm convinced this church did not believe that they were dead. As a matter of fact, you say here that the city found them to be alive, and yet you called them dead. Father, may we be sensitive to your leading as you teach us. We love you, Father. Pray you bless as we examine your word tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We talked over the last couple weeks about the idea of seeing churches, buildings no longer in use, that they now obviously would be considered death, dead. Now, obviously, that death is obvious right now by the condition of the building, but please understand, it didn't start there. Uh, I've talked to many pastors. Uh, I remember it was uh, at one point before I became pastor here, I was candidating in different churches or at least interviewing in different churches. And, and yeah, i got to tell you, there's unique aspects. You know, there's a lot of questions that the people ask the pastor and should. But, you know, we have as many questions when we go into a church. And I was talking to one interim pastor 
Um, he had called me, and uh, I don't even remember his name. We, we, this is literally the only conversation. He called me up, and I was like, so we're chatting and asking questions, and I couldn't believe it. He said, brother, can I be honest with you? You know, I, I just got to say, you ever have been asked that question, like the alternative? What's the alternative? Can I lie to you? I've been lying to you to this point. I don't know why that just came to my mind. He goes, can I be honest with you? I'm like, please, sir. He says, don't come here. Like, Whoa. Someone just left his office angry. I don't know what just happened. And I was like, sir, would you mind being a little more transparent as to why? He said, I've been here six months, and there is no desire for growth in this church. And he said, if this continues, they won't, they won't be in existence. And frankly, if I understand, I didn't, I didn't file a lot to you, but if I understand later, they ended up shutting down and blending in with another church. Uh, they were so focused on what they wanted in church, they had no idea that they missed what God wanted in church. And he said, his comments here, he goes, if something doesn't change, this church is already dead. That's a scary thing to be said. In this church, let's look, look at a couple things. I'm going to start with this. I want to talk about the condemnation to a dead church. Let me take a second here. When we look at the idea of a dead church, some look at numbers, they look at... Uh, here, here's, here's what I hear. I'm just, I'm gonna, from all points of view, and I, I, I check out this from every background you can think of. Some would say my church is jam-packed, it's alive. Some would say, I've even heard this, we're a small group, which makes us love Jesus more. Uh, neither one of those are accurate, by the way, okay? I mean, we can have three of us at church at home. That doesn't make us love Jesus more. Uh, some would say, well, in that church, nobody raises their hands, so it's a dead church. Some would say, everybody's raising their hand. It's a fake church. I'm not kidding. This is the point of view you get. And I hear it from everywhere. Can I encourage us that we don't look at anything when it comes to a dead or a live church from what we think? Because you know what we do when we think of a church? Here, here's what most of us would say is a healthy, vibrant church. They have programs. They have plenty of people to keep it going. And they have money in the bank. Uh, McDonald's has that too, by the way, okay? The problem is, now by the way, I don't think a dead church is broke. Okay? I don't think a live church is broke when people are giving and faithful. But the sign of a healthy church is not whether you have a million dollars in the bank. I'd love a million dollars in the bank. I really would. Frankly, I'd take that million to pay the mortgage off. Right? That's the first thing I would do. I would love that. I think all of us would. But you know, can I ask you, why do you think God doesn't always just hand a church a million dollars? What's that? They do the wrong thing with it. Let me ask you another, and here's the pastor's point of view. If God gave us a million dollars in the bank, you know what would happen? How, much of, how many of us would really fight? How much would feel the need to give if we had a million dollars? I mentioned this morning in this church that I went to talk to the pastor, and uh, he, he said he's at this, in this church, and he said the bigger issue was the church didn't see the need to be concerned about the buildings and stuff because they had money in the bank. They did a large sum, but they were nine months away from it being completely gone. It's a scary thought. Money doesn't always. The key is whether we're walking with God and right with God and going the right direction. So let's look at the condemnation. First of all, the condemnation of a dead church. First of all, here's something. They looked good. They looked good. In that verse, he says, you have a look where the city says you look good. Sardis was a unique place, and there was a lot of... Interesting, I read one interesting part about Sardis. Sardis at one point was a very vibrant city, a huge place people loved to come, and then there was a natural disaster, if I understand correctly, an earthquake. And it kind of leveled much of the area. You know what happened? They never really had the financial ability to build back up, so they lived with this reputation of this great, vibrant city. But the fact is, economically, it was dying on a pretty consistent basis. And that's kind of the idea. They were good at faking, and this church was good at looking good. The community thought they were good. The people in the area thought the church was looking great. But it was Jesus who was the one that looked deeper in to the heart and not just the outside of what it looked like. You know, we can be accustomed to doing church or looking good in church, acting a certain way or, hey, church looks good this way or this is the way it should be. You know, why? Let me talk, I want to talk about the customs side, how it is easy just to look good or just to kind of fit in. You know, the first one, it comes down when we grow up in church. If you grew up in church, you know the right words to say. I, I mean, some younger people here, I won't have you raise your hand. How many of you just love to walk in? Hey, brother, most of us, all right, we don't usually do that. The younger generation, they're like, brother, why is everybody called brother and sister? When I worked in youth group, they used to make fun of that all the time. All right, they're not your, they're not your brother, all right? They, this kind of, that 
church lingo, shall we say. Uh, my favorite, Kyle, Kyle Luca always tells me, I, I think I'm going to say it wrong. Christianese, is that what it is? I said, giant Christianese. It's the language we have in church. All right? And not all of it's bad, not all of it's wrong, but we can become accustomed to looking good in church, acting a certain way. We know how to do it. We can blend into the environment just like we can into the worldly environment that wants nothing to do with God. We've been trained to do that. So we can look as good as we should. That doesn't mean we're right with God. I can say the right things and dress the right way and act the right way and do the right things. That doesn't mean that I and my heart and my family is right with God. It doesn't always mean that. The true evaluation, and please understand, I'm not talking perfection. But the evaluation is not about whether I can put on a good front or look a certain way. It's what does God see going on inside. I read this this week as I was studying for this. And one of the comments that was made about the next generation in this area was the reason they struggle. I thought this was such a great point. They're borrowing their parent faith and it has yet to become theirs. Simple point. At some point, the younger generation, why do they go to church? Why do they do this? Well, because their parents tell them to. I pay the bills, you're coming to church. And that's kind of pretty much how it is. And you're going to love it too. I mean, that's kind of what they're told. Smile when you're in your side, look good. All these things. We've got to look a certain way. And I'm telling you, you become a preacher's kid, it just gets harder. I look back at my preacher's kids. There's a couple others who grew up a preacher's kid. It's a little different. I, you know, you come in and you, you got you to gotta look a certain way. You know what's got to be the worst is a missionary's kid. All right? So every time they walk into church, every time they walk in, the, the, the father's there. He wants to be supported. So what's the church doing? They're watching the kids. You know, you got to know that the dad's up there if you do one thing wrong, right? You know, the kids are over there they're just scared to death. I, I remember one time I met a uh, um, missionary Templeton. I've been to his church twice in Peru, and he came to our church in Columbus, Georgia, and he showed up, and I'm like, I got to ask you a question, Brother Templeton. Prinkley, I thought this was awesome. I say, where's your family? He looked at me, and I said, now let me clarify that. I don't think this is wrong. I think it's great. I'm just curious what you did with your family. He said, they're back at my home at, at school. My son's in school. My wife's doing this. I'm like, brilliant. He goes, my family's sick of being, uh, being judged based upon being missionaries because every time they walk in, they've got to be so perfect and all this. But what happens is the younger generation, they say, well, I do it because I have to. At some point, each and every one of us will have to decide what am I going to do with God? What am I going to do with the word of God? When is the faith, not my parents' faith, the true faith of Jesus going to become mine? And what am I going to do with it? What does it mean when it comes to my salvation, serving, grabbing the mantle oh, that's been handed down? I saw an illustration a long time ago. I debated using it tonight. I, I just don't have all the stuff from it, but I would give you a basic idea of where it was. Uh, it's a pastor, and he's holding, he brought up onto the stage, he brought up, an older guy on this side, and he had set up three-piece suit, perfect, and he brought up a uh, young guy, jeans and a t-shirt. Two extreme points of view right there, just on the dress, on the platform. And he get, handed a baton to the older guy. And he said, now go hand it to the younger guy. Well, now this is all set up. The older guy stood over here, and he's like, I'm not doing it, not until he changes his clothes. And the younger guy he, he's, he goes, take, take he. He goes, I'm not taking it. That guy's stiff. And, he, you know, all that. and so they had this long debate over this. You know what was the unique prem premise of the entire thing? Until this person was willing to hand the baton to the next. He goes, if we don't figure this out, the church will die. Because not only does the next generation need to hand it down, the coming generation needs to grab it and run with it. The future of the church is in their hands moving forward. Sometimes the problem is we still look back on what we used to do. We'll get to that in a little bit. But number three, sometimes we have sin in our lives and are just unwilling to get it right. We're dead because we're, and, I, and but let me clarify, we all struggle in sin. None of us are perfect. I'm talking about a sin that we know is there. We've not confessed. We are unwilling to acknowledge to God that it's right. God says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Number two, not only do we see they look good, they were given a chance to repent. He comes up and he says, take what you've learned and repent. Again, the first thing we see is the mercy of God. We also see a choice all of us have. When God brings to our heart, hey, right here, you're dead. You know, God's not coming and beating us up and saying you're not perfect. I was listening. I was at camp, the teen camp last night. 
and I was listening to the guest speaker. And uh, I, I have to be honest, I had the perfect scenario. So I drove up in my car, not in the big van, which was much more comfortable. All right, my wife's driving the big van, which if you ever do anything huge, you're always afraid to make a mistake. I drove up in the comfortable car. Now, I won't say this. I got out of my four-wheel drive car, and I tried to walk down. I almost died three times. It's just pure ice. And I'm like, I'm walking this way, and I'm going backwards. And I just, I just gave up. Literally, I just turned around and I leaned right into the rest of the cars and went down the hill. And then I walked back up the camp. And I got there, and the problem was getting back to the car. And then I'm pulling backwards, and oh man, I was scared to death. But I got there, and I'm listening to the preacher, and I appreciated the fact that he said he got down to the heart. But one of the things that he talked about, so many, I won't repeat the message, but one of the things is I was thinking through. I even thought about it as I was going home. One of the things that happens in Christianity is we have this battle of this what's called performance-based Christianity. Some run and want to run legalism into it, where and, and the true initial term of legalism is adding to salvation, but in today's day, a lot of times we add works to be good Christians or whatever. Really, I call it performance-based Christianity. Here's what it is. To be a good Christian, I need to not do these six things, and I need to do these seven things. Or frankly, sometimes it's not do these ten and do this one. But however it is, it's this list of rules. Now, by the way, there are things in the Word of God we should do but not do. Amen? Amen. All right, so please don't, don't get me wrong there. But I think what we miss is what we do is say, my value in Jesus, my, my, how good I am as a Christian, is based upon those things. Here's the question. How do you know when you're doing good at it? Do you know what happens? You, you consider yourself a failure the whole time. I, I remember being there. I'm not good enough. I'm not this. Here, here's what I used to do. So I, I, in that, and I don't think it's wrong. I, I knew God called me to preach when I was young. So through my high school years, I preached in children's church. Uh, McKenna's had me preaching in youth group. There's nothing worse than being a teenager preaching to teenagers. And they were encouraging. I was scared to death the entire time. Then I got to preach to adults. And uh, I remember the very first time to do it, my dad goes, what would you think? I'm like, do they sleep all the time during every service? It was just a couple. I mean, this guy, he was out so cold, I thought he was going to have whiplash during the service, to be honest with you. Just, just my perspective for a minute. It was helpful to me because I was scared to death. But through all that time, and I was at, out, out in, in youth activities and youth functions and outreach, and I'm doing everything you're supposed to. But then, you know, I'd go home, and I'd struggle a little bit with the battle, you know, sin. And somehow, Satan put in my mind. A real good Christian wouldn't do that. Anybody else thought that besides me? All right, all three of us. Oh, yeah, I asked ten of us. At least I'm not alone up here. And I hey, a good Christian wouldn't be like that. So I'm like, well, i got to do more good. You know what happens? You just beat yourself up. It's not how God ever intended it to be. God didn't say, listen, if you're good enough to fit all these things, then I'll accept you. You know what God said? I love you. I accept you. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's honestly really simple, not always easy to do, but simple in the pattern. And so when he comes to offer an air of repentance, he's not trying to guilt us down. He's trying to say, listen, I love you. Come back. Let's get this right. Number three, they were, there was a faithful few that still love God. We're talking about the condemnation that Jesus gives to this church. There was a faithful few that still love God. This is more than just claiming to love God. They remained faithful. He says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Here's the premise. It's not I keep his commandments to love. I love, and then it becomes something that I want to do. I, I'll give an illustration given last night. Wouldn't it be bad if I had to try to find a way to show love to my wife like it was forced to me? Oh, i got to go on a date with my wife tonight. How many of you think that's the most romantic thing, right? You just feel so great for my wife right now. If he's like that, man, oh, that's ridiculous. If that, that would be miserable, wouldn't it? Oh, man, you know what? So I look and I'll pick up flowers on the way home. Might as well. Or I got, you know, we can put that out. Now, can I tell you? It's not going to be a great date. You know, I'm just promising you there. Now, if the heart is different... And I've planned it, and I'm ready for a great date tonight. That's a different story. I'm going to enjoy the time. I'm going to enjoy being around her, which I absolutely do. Love being around her, love talking to her, all of that. It's easy to do the things that are expected as a husband. That's the premise. 
when I come, the faithfulness is something that is it's not driven on upon me. It's easy. We can become experts of knowing what to say or what to do or how to act. That doesn't make us Christians or good Christians. That just means, that doesn't even mean what we claim is real. At some point, we have to decide what we will do with what we know. Let's look at number two, steps towards a dying church. Actually, I want to look at one spot. I, I wrote this down. Let me go back up to the verses real quick. I want us to look at one spot. He was talking about, in verse five, he says, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, white talking about purity. He says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and for his angels. There's not a lot in scripture mentioning that, and Revelation is one of those. I'm going to take a minute and explain that, because we'll get into that later in Revelation. So he says again, he says, I will not blot them out, out of the, uh, blot, out, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Now, obviously, the book of life, to an extent, Jesus knows everything. He doesn't have to have a book. But Revelation talks that one day, when you get to, it's a great white throne judgment, there's the books of works, and then there's the book, the book of life. And they will look to see if your name's in the book of life. Now, let me explain what that means. The book of life was, if you want to say a physical book, it's been there before the beginning of time. Everybody who is ever born, his name or her name is in the book of life. All of them. In, in a poor illustration, the way I could say it is, at first it's kind of put there in uh, pencil, all right, because it can be erased. And if you die without Jesus, your name erases from the book of life. Now, when you get saved, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. What does that mean? In that book of life, when I get saved, the Holy Spirit seals that name, makes it permanent. There's nothing I can do to have my name removed from it. There's nothing anybody else can do. That permanence from the Holy Spirit means my salvation is guaranteed. This is what it's referring to. He, you know, he doesn't blot people out. You say, well, I got saved and God blots my name out. No, what he's saying is these people have been faithful. They're truly saved. And they're, I'm going to confess their name because they were truly saved. They weren't putting on a front. They weren't faking. They were saved. I will not, when they die, I will not blot their name out because they're truly saved. There's an important thing to look at. And that, we'll get more details when we get to Revelation. But I didn't want to skip that section in those verses. So let's go back to number two, the steps towards a dying church. So what are some things we do going down? Let me give you four that I wrote. A step towards a dying church. Number one, we ignore the instructions from Jesus. The word of God comes in. We know what we're supposed to do, but I just I don't know if I want to do it. I know the truth, but I don't know if I want to actually do it. James says, be hearers of the word, not just, or be doers of the word, not just hearers only. He describes in that, like I go to the Bible like a mirror, and I recognize the, uh, the blots and the problems I need to fix, and I let the word of God fix it, or I don't. If I walk away, I fool my own self. If I'm willing to look at it and get it right, then there's growth. When I stop allowing the Word of God to be that thing that guides me and directs me and teaches me, then I'm starting towards death. Number two, the church becomes more about me. I put us, but more about me than others. The church becomes more about me than others. It becomes more about my preferences rather than his passion becomes about me more than others. I think I missed something in the letter up there. More about us than others. There it goes. All right? But sometimes, I, I've been in some churches, uh, maybe years ago, when I, when I was growing up, we did uh, a lot of bus ministry. And uh, I was in the bus ministry. And, and the next comment I'm going to say is very true. Church people got frustrated. So these children would come running through the building. And they'd come running through the building, and they would just trash, I mean, and unfortunately, trash the building. People got mad. Well, I don't want those little rats in here. They're gonna, I heard that. They're going to destroy the building. And I remember my dad, one time, I'm sitting, we're at, back in Michigan. Somebody, I don't even remember this, somebody said that in the middle of a, a meeting. We need to get rid of the bus ministry. They're destroying the building. My dad said, I'd rather have young kids in here destroying the building than the perfect building that's dead. And you know, it's funny, we left that church not that long after due to those things. That church runs about six right now, but it's even open. I remember going, we went to visit it. We lived in the parsonage right there on the property. So I drove my wife around the church and it just landscaping, falling apart. I went, this happened to us all the time. People knocking the door. We used to live here. Can we see the house? Sure. Come on in. I thought, how much harm could that be? Hi, my name's Roddy Live. You used to live here. What? You want what? I just want to see the house. No, wham. I'm like, can't wait to go to his church on Sunday. That was my first thought. 
I got in, I'm like, I sat there, and I was my wife, well, you think it'd be creepy if I peeked through the windows? That's what I wanted, right? <laughs> Probably not the right move. The church can become more about us than others. You know, when you use a building, it gets used. But you know, I'd rather, like we walked through, I, I'd gone through the auditorium, and I see little spots where there's stains. It bothers others more than me, but, or maybe not at all. I walk through there, and the little ones bother me. But, you know, I'd rather have things happening and people getting saved than a perfectly clean carpet. We'll just raise the money and put a new carpet in here, amen? That's what we should be doing. That's going forward. The church becomes more about me than about others, about what it looks like and about where I could sit and things of that nature. Years ago, I joked about this. When people would come to church, I'm like, listen, we're going to have visitors Sunday. We do a big day. Please move. Let people, don't, don't kick people out of their seats. I've seen them do it. Not necessarily here, but I've seen them do it. How is that church as him and walked up? You're not supposed to sit here. I mean, I, heard, I, I saw from a distance. You know, I, I was the assistant pastor, and I saw the couple sit down, and I saw the couple who normally reserves that seat coming up. And I'm like, I'm thinking, there's a seat behind it. Just sit behind it. Just sit behind it. I'm sitting there. You know how you ever have those nightmares in slow motion you can't get to where you're supposed to get? I looked at the other, other associate. We're both like, no. We're trying to stop this guy. As he leaned over, you're in my seat. And it was the last time they sat any seat in our church. Got up and walked right out. You know what the worst part was? You know what that couple did? Smiled and sat down in their seat. I never wanted to put a tack in a seat so bad in my life, to be honest with you. You're hearing a lot of negative today. I'm sorry about that. It's in this morning and tonight. I need to sleep a little more. The third step is we find other things that gain our attention. We find other things that gain our attention. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he says this, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed. It wasn't a sin. He didn't leave because of sin. He didn't leave Paul behind because of something bad or an argument. He said he just loved this world more than what he was called to do, and he departed and he left it. That's a, that's a scary, scary thing. When we find other things that gain our attention, then the church is dying. Number four, when we refuse to deal with sin as a church, but also in our own lives. When we do that, the church will die. I'm going to finish with the third point, signs of a dead church. I actually got this from a commentator. Uh, some of you are familiar with the name, Pastor Chuck Swindoll. He's got commentators. I read them. At the end of the chapter, he had five things that he said are signs of a dead church. And so I'm just going to read them. I've got them written down, uh, right in order. And these are the five things that he said, hey, if, you're, if you see this and this, these things happening, your church is either dead or dying. Number one, a dead church worships its past. All the things we used to do, not what we're doing now. A dead church worships its past. And you know what? Isn't it great that a church has a heritage and a history? You know, I walk this property frequently. Uh, I walk it, and uh, I, I hate the parking lot drives me nuts because it's going to cost us so much money. I, I walk out, I see the potholes, and I'm just like, Lord, please, can I, you know, just put a new one out there. But, and I look at things in this older building, things, you know, can fall apart. But I do look at, I remember the day when the gym wasn't there. And before the gym, there was three double-wide trailers, and I remember standing watching it burn down. A bad electrical fire, and it burned it down. Now, let me tell you, I was 10th grade when that happened. My sister comes down, knocks on the door. Get up, get up, the church is on fire. I'm like, no, we live right down the street. I looked out, smoke above the church. So we run, we run over to the church. It's the building we used for school. And I'm standing there, and my brothers had looked at each other. My mom and dad are in tears. All the school supplies are in there, burning down. We look, hey, I don't think there's school tomorrow. That was our thinking. <laughs> Who cares about the fire? There's no school tomorrow. It was awesome. And we're watching all the people put the fire out, and they got it done. In fact, it wasn't long. Uh, a, few, a year ago, a guy was in doing inspection, a fire marshal in the kitchen. He goes, I remember the building used to be here. I'm like, how would you remember? And he showed me his hand. He goes, I grabbed the doorknob, and I wasn't paying attention. I burnt my hand on your doorknob. In the back of my mind, thinking, 
you're trained not to do that. Don't you have gloves or something? And uh, so he goes, I will never forget that building sitting there. But we, I remember the past. And, you know, I, I look at people who throughout the years have invested into me. Please understand, I'm not saying that we don't look back and relish in the heritage. But if we worship the past, we'll never move forward. Number three, a dead church often has carnal and lazy leadership. This is a little scary. <laughs> My part, right? This one's me. This is where it's careful. This is where it's good for one, pray for your pastor, encourage your pastor, keep your pastor accountable. I mean it. My, my, one time, I don't remember which, I don't know, it was my kids or somebody. Must be nice not to have a boss. I got over 200 of them. What are you talking about? Oh, I work for the people of the church. Now he's the premise. If it, you find that, deal with it. Can I tell you? As much as the pastor is a leader, he is accountable to God and the church. And I hope you pray for us, and I hope you expect us to be busy. Over the years, and having staff come in, there's one thing that's never made sense to me. When a staff person comes in, or I'm trying to interview them, and they say, do I really have to put in a full, a full 40 hours this week? And I'm like, would you do that if you worked anywhere else? Well, yeah, but this is the ministry. I'm going to tell you, my first instinct is go home. I mean, like, to where you came from. Get out of here. And it has happened. And I've been asked that more than once. Really? It's just church. And, well, don't get me wrong. You say, who was that? Well, just look, you know, you probably know. You probably know because you would have seen the same attitude. It's sad when the, when the, when the leadership becomes lazy and may that not happen, Lord willing. Number four, a dead church neglects children and youth. Does not place preeminence really can i say this in my point when they neglect families we should always be striving to encourage and reach families amen some of you who kids have come through you've had kids go through and now you have grandkids you want to do it over we'd love i can't say anything my wife and i were panera bread today and as i was waiting for her to come back from filling her drink and i saw this family with these this little boy and this little girl now, you gotta be, you got to understand a little bit of context here. My son is 20 out of high school. My daughter's graduating this year. So I'm an emotional basket case all year long, to be honest with you, all right? So I'm standing there, and I collected my leftovers, and I look over to these little boy and girl, and they're eating their mac and cheese. And I'm sitting here, don't cry, don't cry. Why am I crying in Panera Bread? This is ridiculous. I'm serious. My wife coming over, I'm fine, all right? <laughs> she didn't notice it. i got to be six or seven. And I... I do I miss that time? I miss that. I don't miss the late nights and all the other stuff that comes with it. I miss that, and that's about it. I don't miss the fact that they can drive themselves places. I don't miss, I like that part. Give them the keys and say, pick me up something on the way home. I love that part. But I just watched. I don't want to redo it. <laughs> but I, I look back at that, and I am so glad that through my time, there were people to come and encourage me during those times. That's what we should always do. Number five, a dead church lacks evangelistic and missionary zeal. It lacks evangelistic zeal. Not just loving new people who come or wanting new people to come, but being part of it and encouraging them and, and welcoming them and making them feel at home in what might be a strange atmosphere for them. And get to know their name. Now, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I have to admit, I am absolutely horrible with names. I mean, horrible with names when people come and tell me their name i've got to find some way to remember their name so when i met chris burns so i'm automatically associated with another chris i knew and i had to do that i have to remember some how many of you know he's a, he's a member of our church sylvester presley i'm talking about i you will understand none of the none of you will get will get this part all right so when he came to me and i said what's your name he goes sylvester presley you know how i got to find a way to remember that you know what i did sylvester stallone Got this. All right. Those of you who know Sylvester Presley, you, have, you know exactly why. All right. He's an old African-American gentleman. Now you understand why Sylvester Stallone didn't work in that one, okay? I've never forgotten his name. I walked up the next week, Sylvester, how you doing? You, you remembered my name. I'm like, I'm not telling you how. <laughs> and I said to him, <laughs> I'm not telling you how. <laughs> I'm horrible with names. It's bad when I'm at home. And when I'm lazy on my couch, and I call for one of my kids to get something for me or turn the lights off, you know what's, okay, Nathan's standing right there. Caleb, Michaela, Rusty, who are you, right? 
Rusty's my dog, by the way, and I've done that. Caleb looks at me, really? I'm serious. It's really, you know, I look at my youngest and I say, Rusty, it's really bad when I call the dog Caleb. It really gets confusing then. But you know there's something special when someone comes back and somebody remembered their name? Try it. You know what I say? Write it down. I'm going to pray for this person this week. You know, it's interesting. I mentioned this morning that you never know when we have guests and you never know. And we gave the gospel, you know, two ladies called upon Jesus today for salvation. You just never know, do you? you know, can I, can I, I got to tell you the story and how. This just amazes me. Some of you have known there's a gentleman who comes. Uh, he's been here, what, three times maybe? Uh, very energetic. And I asked the one lady, I said, how did you find out about us? And she goes, I can't remember his name. And I'm sorry, I just went through names and I can't remember it. But, and uh, she goes, he invited me. I'm like, how'd you meet him? He goes, you're not going to believe this. He walked up to me on the street one day and said, do you want to be a pen pal? They didn't know each other. Do you want to be a pen pal? She goes, sure. She goes, I was kind of nervous at first, but he's become a really good friend. And then we started talking back and forth, and she goes, I need, I'm trying to find a church open. Oh, I know one of Ben Salem. I'll pick you up. And drove them both here today. If you heard him this morning, well, I got two friends in church today. He told everybody that today. You know what I'm talking about now. Some of you saw us all taking pictures in the back foyer. And I think we took about nine. And he just, he pulled in people who had no idea what was going on. I'm in a picture with some people. You know, we look back and we can say, I know what I saw. I saw some guy that brought people to church. I, I, it was amazing to me. I, no, nobody else got to see this. Right after we did the time for the sinner's prayer, I looked back and I saw him there. And I know he, he, I guess we'd known the two ladies would pray because he looked at me. He goes, right there, he's doing this. Let me know that he done it. <laughs> when we lose, when somebody getting saved doesn't stir your heart, that's a dead church. I'd rather be comfortable in the pew than somebody. I'd rather be completely uncomfortable in the pew when somebody gets saved. Amen? That's where we should be. That. Now, tonight we look at what Jesus said about a church that was convinced it was fine. This morning we talked about a couple aspects of what a healthy church looks like. I would like to say, from my perspective, and I would say COVID has proven this, and generally speaking, we're a healthy church. I personally think I'd love to see more people saved and baptized. I hope nobody would say they wouldn't want that. I'd love to see more. Our baptistry still got a leak. I'll fill it up every week. That's fine with me. We'll find a way to make it work to get through. We'll put a bucket. I remember the one time someone said, I think we got a leak. I don't remember even, Bob, how I got down there. There was a leak downstairs, and I, walk, I crawled under the baptist, and there's a five-gallon bucket that had been sitting there for months, slowly dripping in the bucket, and the bucket was overflowing, and that's where the leak came from. We are a Baptist church, and that's how you solve a leak, right? <laughs> Can I tell you that we should enjoy fellowship. We should enjoy worship. We should learn what it means to have Jesus continue to work in our hearts. And it should desire us every week to hear of somebody that calls upon Jesus and gets saved. Somebody's life has changed forever. You know, churches die way before you see it. And I hope you pray with me that we never get there. That we go... The opposite way, that this year, 2021, we see families join and people come and get involved because that is where life is. And may we love them all when they walk through that door, no matter where they come from, and love them to Jesus, to church, and may they find a place that tries to show the love of Jesus to anybody that walks in.